Good afternoon. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Sustainably Sustaining Power. I'm Jeanette Wards and I'm part of the marketing team at Coda Power Systems EMEA. Today, our presenter is Ian Wilcoxon, Data Centre Manager for Coda Power Systems EMEA. Before we officially open the event, I'd like to cover some basic housekeeping just to improve your experience. The default audio is through your computer. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. The full presentation will take approximately 35 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. We'll be using the questions function to take questions from the audience. You can ask questions throughout the presentation and Ian will answer as many as possible at the end of his session. A recording of the webinar will be sent out to you via email within the next 24 hours. Should you wish to receive the CPD certificate, please respond to that email. Now that the webinar has started, you'll be muted to give you the best webinar experience. In order to give you a full view of the slides, we'll be switching our cameras off. Now I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Ian Wilcoxon, Data Centre Manager for Cola Power Systems, EMEA. Uh, thank you, Jeanette, and uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. Okay. Uh, so let's look at the uh, learning objectives and structure of, uh, of today's CPD. First, I'll give you a brief overview of who we are, uh, an introduction uh, into exhaust emissions and emissions regulations, uh, how to reduce diesel exhaust emissions, uh, and then we'll look at sustainability using biodiesel, uh, renewable diesel, hydrogen in combustion engines, and some forms of non-combustion power. Uh, we'll also look at some practical approaches available today and some considerations when choosing your power protection supplier. And as Jeanette says, we'll then uh, move on to questions at the end. So COLA was first established in 1873 and uh, it's still a family owned business today. It employs 36,000 associates over 50 production sites and in 17 countries. I work for COLA Power Systems, EMEA, uh, which is part of the Cola Power Division, but we also have five other business units. Um, and just going around those, we've got Cola Uninterruptible Power, who supply UPS systems for mission critical applications, Cola Sorel, who manufacture switchgear and control systems, and then Cola Home and Commercial Generators, and Co Cola Industrial Engines, manufactured engines for industrial applications, such as excavators and pumps. And finally, Clark Energy, uh, who manufacture gas and gas CHP generators. So we are the third largest generator OEM in the world. We manufacture generator sets from just a few kilowatts, uh, which is a small unit on the left hand side of your screen, right up to the largest data center designed high speed generator set in the world, rated at 4000 kilowatts, 60 hertz, or 4,500 kilowatts, uh, sorry, KVA uh, 50, uh, in 50 hertz. Uh, we also package them in-house into simple drop-over enclosures, which is a unit in the center of your screen, to the larger ISO style containers, which are typically 12 meters long, right through to bespoke walk-in enclosures, which are capable of achieving very low noise levels within the smallest of footprint, and therefore best suited to um, hyperscale data centers. So exhaust emissions. With exhaust emissions, the main constituents of concern are oxygens of nitrogen or NOx, uh, particulate matter uh, or sulfur oxides. Uh, all of these have an adverse effect on us and the environment and can cause things like respiratory problems such as asthma, uh, heart disease, uh, they can, of course, affect vegetation uh, and, and particulate matter can cause smog in densely populated areas and uh, sulfur oxides uh, can cause acid rain. So what are the emissions regulations? Uh, well, in the UK and in Europe, there are three main sets of rules that apply to generator emissions. The medium combustion plant directive sets emissions limits for sulfur oxide for NOx and particulate matter by fuel type 
A medium combustion plant is defined as that with a thermal input of between 1 and 50 megawatts. Permitting for specified generators, this includes an additional assessment of location relative to sensitive areas using dispersion modelling, for example. Now, for mobile applications and generators under one megawatt, the outdoor noise and non road mobile machinery directive apply. Now, emergency generators are excluded from the requirements of specified generators and MCPD. That's because there are no emissions for an emergency generator in standby mode. And in fact, they could be considered insignificant compared to the emissions of the facility or building they're supporting. However, a permit is still required from the relevant body. The Environment Agency uh, in England, uh, SEPA in Scotland, NRW in Wales, and the NIEA for Northern Ireland. And that's to ensure that they're operated as standby machines, so restrictions are applied, such as limiting the number of hours to for 50 hours a year, uh, that's test hours. Uh, generators cannot be tested during peak times, and the tests need to be staggered if multiple generators are, used, are installed on site. Also, emergency generators may not be used for demand side response, such as triad avoidance. However, in the event of a power outage, the emergency generators can operate for an unlimited number of hours. So let's consider the balancing of combustion products in diesel generators. Well, particulate matter forms from the partial combustion of the diesel fuel in the cooler parts of the engine. NOx is a result of higher cylinder temperatures oxidizing some of the nitrogen from the air. The trade-off, unfortunately, is they have an inverse relationship when it comes to in-cylinder engine management for performance and emissions. So what ways are there to reduce harmful exhaust emissions? Well, we can optimize a combustion control, but as we discussed on the prior slide, that has trade-offs, so it's limited in what it can achieve. To reduce particulates, we can fit filters, which do reduce performance a little, but is manageable. In automotive applications, filters can use engine heat to regenerate, but unfortunately, this is not feasible in standby generators, when engines only run for short periods. We can fit SCR systems to reduce NOx. This is where a urea solution is sprayed into the exhaust and as it passes over a catalyst, it converts around 95% of the NOx into nitrogen and water. Again, widely used in automotive applications, but the catalyst needs to reach 450 to 500 degrees C to work. So for testing standby generators, we need to work the engine hard to reach these temp operating temperatures, which can be done by putting them on low banks, but it does make regular testing more difficult. Sulfur oxide reduction, the most effective route, including generator engines, is to limit the amount of sulfur in the fuel. However, large machine, uh, marine propulsion engines continue to use high sulfur fuel these days and scrub it out using sodium hydroxide but the high sulfur content does reduce the effectiveness of the NOx scrubbing catalysts. So how else can we reduce harmful exhaust emissions? Well, another approach is to use liquid fuels that burn more cleanly than diesel. Uh, one of these is GTL diesel. This is made by converting clean burning natural gas into an easy handling liquid fuel. Gas to liquid conversion involves processing natural gas in three stages. The first, the natural gas is converted into syngas, then the syngas into a, into a catalyst, into long chain liquid hydrocarbons, and the final stage is cracking the hydrocarbons and isomerization into GTL liquids. The benefits are it produces a drop in fuel that is much cleaner burning than petrol or diesel in terms of sulfur oxide and particulate matter, and it provides a 13% drop in CO2 emissions at the exhaust pipe. However, GTL diesel ultimately comes from natural gas. Uh, the picture below is Shell Pearl, uh, which produces GTL diesel. This is fed by 22 offshore gas rigs in Qatar. 
therefore on a well to wheel basis due to transportation and processing in some studies gtl fuel is estimated to use 40 to 50 percent more energy per mile and can produce 9 to 13 percent more co2 than even standard diesel so perhaps it's better suited as a transportation fuel in areas where there's high local pollution rather than used in standby generators now there are other ways of making synthetic diesel but these only slightly reduce the greenhouse gas emissions so emissions reduction nowadays is much more than just clean air of course while combustion control you know exhaust scrubbing or gtl fuels are a way to reduce emissions that are harmful locally you know every day aren't we we're all reminded to look at the much wider impact of what we do for this reason organizations must also consider their emissions of greenhouse gases commonly measured as an emissions equivalent to carbon dioxide so what are the alternatives well we can run engines on biodiesel historically biodiesel had been made from fatty acid methanol easter fuels and it's made by processing vegetable oils or animal fats with methanol usually itself made from natural gas uh, if it's made from waste products or sustainable plants co2 emissions upon combustion are not counted for greenhouse gas auditing now compared to fossil diesel particulate matter emissions are lower fossil diesel has 95 grams per co2 equivalent per megajoule of energy and famed biodiesel could be considered to have a 52 grams of CO2 equivalent. But there are disadvantages of famed up biodiesel. Now, the feedstock, such as rapeseed oil, competes with food production. Both NOx emissions and fuel consumption are increased versus regular diesel. The fuel quality varies with feedstock and it has a six month storage limit and whilst it absorbs more water than regular diesel the biggest problem is that algae can form in the fuel and it suffers from fuel instability the deposits within the fuel have potential to block the pipework in fact the picture on the right hand side of your screen you can see a filter that was removed from a diesel genset engine running on famed biodiesel and the filter is completely blocked so these factors make 100% famed biodiesel unsuitable for standby applications. However, when blended with regular diesel at sort of 10 to 20% concentration, the existing fuel additives will keep the system healthy. And as is normal practice for diesels anyway, always ensure a water separator is fitted. Uh, now, always check with the manufacturer if the specific model is approved for use with blended fuel and what the blend is as there is currently lots of variation in the market and the situation does change regularly so how can we improve on biodiesel well hvo or hydrogenated vegetable oil uses hydrogen and a thermal chemical process to convert the feedstock into a uniform fuel with properties similar to gtl but can and is made from used uh, slash waste cooking oil and can be made from non-food plants such as Jotropha and even produced from algae. So looking at fossil diesel again, it has a 95 grams per CO2 equivalent and biodiesel has a 44 grams per CO2 equivalent. Looking at HVO in more detail, well, the quality is less dependent on feedstock and properties can be adjusted for uh, cold climates. As I've said, the CO2 equivalent footprint is below fossil or fame biodiesel using the equivalent feedstock and even lower if the feedstock is used is, uh, is used cooking oil and sourced from a near, uh, near the refinery. Now, energy output per litre is higher than fame biodiesel. It's a drop in fuel, so no changes are required to the engine's fuel system. It also has a lower NOx emissions than regular diesel, and we've proven that in our test cells. Now, there are some considerations, of course. Uh, users can select HVO from UCO and non palm oil. Uh, HVO costs around 10% more than regular diesel. Uh, 
production requires only 0.1 to 0.3 uh, tonnes of hydrogen uh, per HVO, per tonne of HVO. So it's, it's a very small amount. And so looking at the greenhouse gas impact chart, you can see HVO is significantly less than famed biodiesel. And when made from used cooking oil on the far right hand side of the chart, its, it's CO2 equivalent is around 90% less than regular diesel. OK, so let's consider using hydrogen now in a combustion engine. Well, hydrogen burns very cleanly, of course, producing only water as it combines with oxygen in the air. Now, like a petrol engine, uh, it requires an ignition, so it's not a drop in fuel for diesel engines. Um, it has a lower initial torque, so a larger engine would need to be installed to handle the initial load step compared to a diesel engine producing the same electrical output. Uh, it does result in higher combustion temperatures with some emissions of NOx. However, if you have a supply of hydrogen, the main reason not to use it in a combustion engine is efficiency. The combustion of hydrogen to produce kinetic energy is around 25% efficient, and that kinetic energy has to be then converted into electrical energy, reducing the efficiency further. In contrast to producing electricity direct from hydrogen in a fuel cell, which can be around about 60% efficient. So looking, so let's consider producing electricity then without combustion. Well, the first thing to say about fuel cells is they're not new. Uh, they were first invented by a Welsh lawyer and physicist, uh, Sir William Grove in 1839. Uh, modern PEM versions run on hydrogen and use a proton exchange membrane to create hydrogen ions and a stream of electrons produce an electrical current. Energy conversion, uh, as I've said, is around 60% versus combustion at 25%, uh, and the emissions are only water vapor and heat. Now, fuel cells can be compact and, of course, can and offer low noise. Now, in theory, one kilogram of hydrogen holds as much energy as one gallon of diesel. Uh, hydrogen can be made cleanly using renewable energy and a PEM fuel cell, but running in reverse. Now, however, today, 95% of hydrogen is made by steam reformation of natural gas. Now, making one kilogram of grey hydrogen this way emits 11 tonnes of CO2, with a greenhouse gas impact of between 89 and 91 grams. So almost the same as conventional diesel. Plus, of course, diesel emissions are only produced when the gen set's running. Uh, even grey hydrogen is expensive. It's around $1.70 per kilogram versus $1.40 for diesel. Uh, the greenhouse gas impact can be reduced to around 22 grams by capturing and storing the CO2 produced or using renewable or waste fuels to heat the process. But really, it's only possible in locations where uh, suitable CO2 storage, for example, old salt mines or exhausted gas deposits. Now, this is known as blue hydrogen. Uh, blue hydrogen currently costs around $1.90 to $2 per kilogram. Now, of course, PM based renewable powered production of green hydrogen uh, results in 0 to 16 grams per CO2 equivalent, depending on the process. But currently the costs are around about four to six dollars per kilogram. Now global green hydrogen capacity is increasing and the cost will fall but there are other practical considerations. So the biggest challenge with hydrogen is its storage. Uh, current hydrogen infrastructure is geared to short-term use for large users such as refineries. The rest is supplied as bottled gas. Uh, tanks are complex. Uh, Toyota's Mirai, uh, a vehicle, uh, has around about seven, has a 700 bar lightweight compressed hydrogen tank. However, the tank weighs 16 times more than the 5.6 kilograms of hydrogen it stores. Uh, compressed hydrogen takes up to four times the storage footprint of liquid hydrogen. Currently, most scale, uh, large scale liquid storage is in, only within space uh, programs. 
the picture on the right hand side of your screen shows a tank installed actually in NASA. Uh, now hydrogen suffers from boil off, so it loses around 0.1 to 0.95 percent per day depending on the type of storage. However, boil off can be collected as a gas and used for testing of equipment or, uh, or sold. Now there are significant planning requirements and neighbourhood concerns with storage of uh, hydrogen uh, and also the overall footprint can actually be larger than diesel generators with their fuel tanks and obtaining supply and refilling if in use for extended periods can be quite challenging. Okay, moving on. So another way, of course, of providing uh, a power, emergency power without combustion uh, is through the use of batteries. Now, batteries are already installed on many mission critical sites as they are used in UPS systems. There has been significant advances in battery technology in terms of density uh, use, uh, of storage using lithium batteries. Uh, there is a possibility to change the approach. Uh, and use energy stored in batteries for grid support, which could, which can actually create an income. Uh, again, though, there are some considerations. Uh, lithium batteries, although much less than they used to be, are still expensive. Uh, the greenhouse gas impact of lithium cell production, supply, recycling is relatively high, and that's, of course, before you even charge them. So as you can see, the greenhouse gas equivalent of a lithium ion battery is around 28 grams. So much higher than HVO when used from uh, used cooking oil. So made from used cooking oil. Now their footprint is significant, and there are some similar concerns actually to hydrogen bulk storage in terms of mass deployment due to things like fire safety. And unlike liquid fuels, if an outage is longer than the planned autonomy of the system, then it's simply not a case of topping up fuel tanks. So what are the practical steps we can look at now? Well, compliance with emissions and permit legislation is of course essential. Uh, look at specifying UCO, HVO compatible generators, as it is a drop in fuel. It's stable. It's an economic alternative to standard diesel. Of course, always keep an eye on technology development. And, and of course, remember that there are no emissions from a generator in standby mode as they're not running. And of course, choose a supplier who is committed to sustainability and consider if the solution is practical, impactful, and of course, financially viable today. So just some key questions to ask a supplier. So what is the basis of their claims? Are they proven in field? Are, are they factory tested or are they an extrapolation of the data? Are they the OEM of the complete package? Uh, including engine, fuel cell, tanks, enclosure, and of course, how flexible are their packaging options for installation on site? Um, what is the availability and historical delivery on time performance? Uh, and what are the running and maintenance costs of any solution you're considering? Uh, we would always say assess the financial stability and longevity of the solution provider. And what are their service and spares capability? You know, how many engineers do they have? You know, are they directly employed uh, or are they subcontracted? And of course, where are the spares held for this solution? Is it domestic or are they uh, uh, overseas? So just to conclude, um, regulations and corporate responsibility uh, require us all to focus on the reduction of harmful emissions and improve sustainability. Uh, the emissions from modern diesel engines are much cleaner and can be reduced further using filters or SCR systems. Uh, there are a, a variety of diesel fuel alternatives available today. You know, hydrogen will become more interesting as green hydrogen infrastructure is developed, but it's not ready at present. Uh, large battery banks provide an option, but we need to consider the cost footprint and the full uh, greenhouse gas impact. And HVO made from used cooking oil arguably presents the cleanest, most sustainable and affordable interim solution today. And finally, 
of course, check the claims and longevity and support of a potential supplier. And uh, now we'll take any questions. Thanks, Ian. That was a really informative presentation. Uh, during the presentation, we've had several questions submitted. The first question is from Richard, and he asks, do HBO compatible gensets cost more? Uh, no, they don't. It's a simple answer to that one, actually, uh, Richard. Um, we've tested all of our KD series uh, generator sets on HVO. Uh, they are with, and we made no modifications to the fuel system. Um, I guess we're, our engines are a modern design engine, um, and therefore there is no cost impact whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, this next question is from Alex and he says, you mentioned that energy output of HVO is around 5% less than regular diesel. Does that affect performance? Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, so it is around about 5% less than regular diesel, yeah, as I said, and, and, and the effect, it, but it doesn't affect performance. And that's really because uh, the engine will use uh, a little bit more fuel, but the, but the actual fuel system of the engine um, is more than capable of, of, of um, making up for that, if you like. So there's no uh, impact on out, out and out performance or its block loading capability. The engine will operate, you know, uh, it'll produce the same electrical output. It's identical. Okay, thanks, Ian. The next question is from Claire. She says, you mentioned that the carbon footprint of a genset in standby mode is insignificant compared to the data center that it's supporting. But surely it requires some power for heaters. Oh, okay, yeah. So yeah, they do. They, they historically they they have required heaters and, and do do need heaters actually. Um, and that's really only uh, to ensure that when the engine starts, you know, there's no uh, moisture inside the alternator, uh, and engines actually produce more uh, produce their power better uh, when they're when they're warm. They don't need to be hot. They need to be around about 45 to 50 degrees, but they do need heating. Now, what we do, um, what we do uh, to sort of get around that, if you like, is that we'll heat um, the, the the gensets from through a heat exchanger from the waste heat from the data center. Uh, so really, they're just using waste heat. So again, it just reduces their uh, their carbon impact. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is from Abdul. He says, is grey hydrogen wide, widely available in the UK? Um, no, it isn't. And, and I think that's um, part of the challenge, really. Um, I believe, uh, I looked a few weeks ago, actually, because I was kind of was wondering if I get this question. And at the moment, even refuel, even, you know, hot, uh, four courts, if you like, um, there's only 11... Uh, refuel, refueling stations in the UK uh, currently. I think there's a plan to add a couple more to that over this year, but I guess that gives you a sense of the availability of it. Um, and that's, you know, as I said, that's 90, that's 95% of the, the hydrogen available today is grey hydrogen. Um, so it's not made from a, a renewable fuel, uh, renewable source. Okay, um, this next question is from Lynn and she asks, when using HBO, will warranty terms remain the same? Yes, simple, simple answer to that one, exactly the same. Um, you know, HVO is made to an e e EN standard, um, so providing you source, you couldn't source a HVO without being, you know, not to, a, to that EN standard anyway. I think it's 15940, I think that's the right standard. If, I've got it right. Um, so yeah, warranty isn't affected. It's it's identical. Okay, thanks. The next question is from David, and he says, "Hi, the medium duty combustion plant directive requires generators with a thermal input above one megawatt to be certified. As a rule of thumb, what would the typical kilowatt rating be of a one megawatt thermal input generator?" Okay, that's a good. That's a really good question, and it's a, it's a sort of a so the non-road mobile machinery uh, directive <clears throat> um, only considers generators above 560 kilowatts. So, so that kind of the two the two things sort of dovetail together, if you like. So I would work 
560 kilowatts would be my figure that I would advise. Okay, there's a question here from Chris. There's a quick question on the emergency generator not being part of the emissions regulations. Does this relate to the London Plan too? The London Plan too. Um, well, it should do. I mean, of course, you there's a, there's always can, you know councils can apply more stringent uh, emissions than or for for a standby generator set and we do see that and uh, i'm not that familiar with london but it's perfectly feasible that the london boroughs could say uh, we want you to be part of mpcd or mcpd now that's fine because that just means that you need to fit um, or we need to supply with the generator set an scr system to to to, to get it to fall within the uh, the requirements of mcpd Thanks. Um, Kevin asks, can existing diesel engines be converted to HVO usage? Uh, oh, now that's a tricky one, isn't it? Because, you know, we've tested our engines. We know that the fuel system is compatible with HVO. We know that there's no impact on performance. Uh, we know that it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it works. They just work. Older generator sets, older engines using different technology. Um, I would have to just say check with your manufacturer really, it's difficult for us to comment I guess, because every engine's different, you know, every manufacturer designs engines different, so speak to your manufacturer there I think. Thank you for that. Um, Adam has asked what are COLA's targets for reducing net emissions? Okay, so yeah, I mean just like all uh, organisations we are, um, we are reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I believe we've already reduced our, our greenhouse gas emissions for like 48% since 2008. And uh, we, we're, you know, we're committed to achieving a net greenhouse gas across all our operations uh, and zero waste to landfill by uh, 2035. Thanks for that. The next question is from Susan. She says, is low sulfur fuel widely available? Yes, it is. So low sulfur fuel actually was introduced um, for the on highway um, when on highway uh, on on road on ve you know road vehicles. Uh, I think it was reduced and in, introduced in about 2006, uh, and that was actually to coincide with the introduction of SCR systems. Um, and most vehicles will be running on SCR systems these days. Um, you'll know if you've got an, a vehicle that's running a SCR because you'll have a a small inside your, your fuel filler you'll have another cap and it'll say add blue on it and you you put a add blue in there so it, it was introduced in 2006 initially i think now um we're ultra low sulfur diesel fuel levels and i believe globally um ultra low sulfur has to be available um by i think 2030 something like that Thanks. Um, Ravi has asked, with HBO 100, would we require for larger fuel tanks compared to regular diesel for similar or the same run times, e.g. 24 hour, etc.? Yeah, you, yes, you would. You, you, you would have to increase your fuel tank slightly. I mean, 5% roughly. So not, not a huge amount. Um, and of course, um, what can I say? Yeah, you, you would have to, you would, yeah, simply put, you would have to just increase them slightly by about 5%. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Andrew. He says, are HVO generator and battery systems being recognised as secondary emergency supplies for compliance with BS 85-119? If so, where? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not familiar with that standard, I'll be quite honest with you. Was that Andrew? Um, um, I'll have to check up on that one for you, Andrew, and uh, we'll have to get back to you. Okay, um, the next question is from um, Shaw. It says, is HVA readily available in the UK and how costly is it compared to diesel? Yeah, so it is readily available. Um, there is, there's several companies actually um, distributing uh, HVO. Um, the one I see quite a lot, um, I'm quite um, is a company called Crown Oils. They're already distributing um, 
diesel fuel, the standard diesel fuel. Uh, so it is readily available. Um, there are, um, you know, there are data centers that are, are running on HVO. And I think, depending on obviously your supplier, but you, you should be paying around about 15% more for HVO compared to standard diesel. Um, I guess in a standby application, um, that additional cost, whilst, it's, whilst there is an additional cost, of course, you're not actually burning through that fuel and it can be stored for 10 years. So actually, you know, the long term overall cost is not, the increase in cost is not that significant. That's great, thank you. Um, Claire's asked, are there any different storage requirements for HVA? No, no, they're, they're not actually, Claire. It's exactly the same. Uh, it is a drop in fuel. So, so what we mean by that actually is that it can actually be it can actually be combined with diesel regular diesel fuel. So, um, the, the fuel system is exactly the same. No changes whatsoever. You can alternate even between HVO and regular diesel. As I say, you can blend the two. Um, so, you know, if for if for whatever reason um, it was um, difficult to you know to source regular diesel, you could use HVO and vice versa. That's great, thank you. Um, Martin has says, where do you assemble the larger above one megawatt containerized gen sets? Uh, so we assemble. So our factory is based in France. So the generators are all manufactured in France. Um, all the KD series is manu are manufactured in France. We also enclose them um, in France uh, into the uh, ISO style containers that, are, that I showed on the screen. And we also produce the walk-in enclosures in France as well. Um, we, do we don't just manufacture in France, of course, we're a global organization. Uh, so we also manufacture enclosures and generator sets in the US um, for the local market. Uh, and in China and in Singapore for their local markets. And just sort of coming back to the UK, we also have a, um, a third party packager that we can use um, for, for enclosures uh, for, the, for the UK market uh, if we need, if, we, um, if, they're, if they're, their solution, the solution that we can produce and design through them makes uh, is better suited to the site, I guess. That's great. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thanks for those comprehensive responses. Um, so that's that's it for the webinar today. Thank you very much for joining us. An evaluation form will appear at the end of the webinar. We'd be really grateful if you could spare a minute to complete the form to help us continue to improve our webinar event. A recording of this presentation will be forwarded to you in a follow-up email. If you'd like to receive a CPD certificate, please do reply to that email. Once again, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, um, Jeanette. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. I hope you found the content interesting and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a pleasant afternoon. Stay safe and well. And the team will look forward to hearing from you soon. Thanks, then. Bye bye.